Welcome to this NCO8 webinar. We should have been together in Wageningen for the annual scientific meeting, mingling, meeting and networking. Unfortunately, COVID showed its powers of disruption yet again, and the annual scientific meeting will be postponed to somewhere April, May next year. Even this very webinar almost didn't happen due to COVID. And it's a big thank you to Erika van Gennep, who has been working behind the scenes very hard to make all this happen, despite being ill with COVID. We wish you well. Also, a big thank you for the team here at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science. Hans and team, thank you for making this happen at the very last minute. And also, we noticed a small error. You may have seen it's actually stronger together and there's room for improvement and perhaps we can blame this as well on COVID. The annual scientific meeting will be held later in April, May. Please subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on the latest information when this actually will be. We hope you'll enjoy today's lineup of speakers and don't forget to post your questions on the online chat function. If we do not answer your question today, we will take it with us in the preparation of the annual scientific meeting coming up. Without further delay, I present to you Ludo Hellebrekers, Director of Wageningen Bioveterinary Research. And Ludo is also the official host of today and of the ASM on behalf of Wageningen University and Research. Ludo, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Maarten. And ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this meeting. Indeed, we had hoped to see you all at the Wageningen campus. Then we thought that we would broadcast this from the Wageningen studio, um, but we're now broadcasting it from the greater Wageningen area based in Amsterdam at the KNW, for which, as Martin said, we are duly grateful. As Wageningen University and Research is the host, I thought I would start with this slide which actually describes the motto of the Wageningen University Research Strategic Plan for these years, finding answers together. And that, I think, is also the power of NCOH. We work together to find answers with a wide variety of partners, building networks, sharing data, and combining forces to tackle societal needs. And while doing so, we are trying and working on establishing new partnerships and collaborative networks to tackle tomorrow, tomorrow's challenges. And there are certainly challenges on our way, very obviously. And I want to mention two. One, the first one that I want to mention is the challenge that we have for the well-being of the young up-and-coming researchers in our group. These are hard times for many people, I will acknowledge that, but these are very much hard times as well for the young researchers, the young postdocs, PhD students. And I ask you all to consider that because I do think this is a task for the whole broad NCOH community. The other aspect that I consider a strong challenge is that we have to add to the societal value of NCOH. And that, I think, can be best accomplished by truly working in a, whatever you want to call it, cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, as long as we work together with all these different disciplines that are part of the NCOH family. There are certainly lessons learned from the recent times. And we're not just talking COVID, we're also talking about avian influenza, swine influenza, hepatitis E, and other um, risks that surround us. I think it's clear that we, are, uh, we will agree on the importance of early detection and preparedness for all these different um, infections. And we have to consider the fact that on a national level, there are big challenges for us because we have a high density, we have a high density both in the human population as well in the animal population in the Netherlands. 
So NCOH can be instrumental in tackling these problems, tack um, providing a early detection, a good control outbreak, and impact mitigation. I think the challenge for us in the near future relate to redefining a robust and resilient Netherlands, designing an improved pandemic preparedness scheme, maintaining, while well we do so, maintaining and strengthening the focus on that combined approach on human, animal and ecosystem health. An integral vision and a strategy on major health issues can help to improve the quality of life. And that is what NCOH stands for. The next challenge, I think, is a reconsideration, perhaps, of the balance between, on the one side, the scientific excellence and exposure that we all want to accomplish and that we all stand for, but on the other hand, also having enough attention and focus on addressing societal needs. Real-time data sharing, open science developments, and recognition and rewards of our staff, of our students, of our postdocs and PhDs. That is something that we want and we need to pay attention to. And if we do all that, I think NCOH can even further uh, improve their contribution to the societal needs and to the science. And that, I think, will be the next step up. And until then, I want to invite you all to the, the spring meeting, the exact date to be determined, but I hope that you will be part of that um, whenever it happens in April or May. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ludo, for this. Oh, Ludo, I have two questions for you. <laughs> Sorry. Don't go just yet. You mentioned something about social needs and addressing them. What can we as NGO8 provide for the society, particularly in this dire situation we're in? How, how do you see that? Well, I think, in my opinion, the NGO8 in, in their um, collaborative effort holds an enormous amount of knowledge and um, potential to address these questions. But I think we need to focus on collaborating outside of our own niche of expertise. Uh, and I think that is where the NCOH can make a difference, and that's where the NCOH has made a difference, by showing that interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach actually does help to address these, these major issues. And I think that's the way to make a step forward. And what role do we play as individual partners within the consortium of NCOH? Well, that is um, almost a moral question. I think many of us um, are very much aware of, the, of the, the, the battle almost between scientific excellence and scientific visibility um, in getting things published um, getting high ratings, um, being successful in obtaining new grants, um, while at the same time, um, that achievement, those achievements might be at risk if you are willing to share data with others. Well, that sharing data and combining data might actually help society a step further. So it's again, it's one of my slides, balancing between scientific excellence and, and visibility and providing societal answers or answers to societal needs. That I think is something that we should consider. I look forward to the discussion at the ASM on this. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Little. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker. Professor Dick Hederich, Chair of the NCOH Executive Board, Vice Dean for Research at the University of Utrecht, <laughs> full professor in environmental epidemiology and one health at Utrecht University, and Chair Expert Panel at the Veterinary Medicines Institute. Professor Hederich, you will tell us more about what has been achieved under the NCOH umbrella in the past five years, and maybe you'll tell us a little bit what may lay ahead. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, and Ludo Hellebreikers uh, looked strongly forward uh, with some provocative ideas. Uh, as a chair, I will mainly look uh, look back in in my uh, few minutes uh, that are now coming. Um, first, maybe go back to where we started, uh, and and the basic idea was that we wanted to combine animal health, human health, and ecosystem health. And I think that choice, uh, now more than five years ago, uh, was really a very timely choice. Uh, now looking at the pandemic, we are in discussions on ecosystem collapse, uh, etc. Uh, and, and I think that showed to be a very viable uh, decision and choice to, uh, to start with NCOH. And Ludo already showed the strategic themes we decided upon, uh, which I think is, is still really relevant, focusing on antimicrobial resistance, emerging infectious diseases, smart and healthy farming, and wildlife uh, uh, and ecosystem health. Um, those four topic ac topics actually led to, uh, to a research program uh, we developed uh, and actually all our PhD projects uh, were brought together in this research program consisting of three main topics, uh, complex systems, metagenomics, disease intervention studies, and vector-borne diseases. And it's good to realize that when we started NCOH, the contributing partners invested in NCOH, but when you look at what has been achieved over those five years, uh, we now have, for instance, more than 65 PhD students working in the framework of, the, of NCOH. And that is more than three times, actually, what was basically invested by the different partners. So this shows that this community is really viable uh, with, with uh, almost 100 principal investigators and more than 400 active participants that work together in those collaborative projects with those PhD students. Um, and part of that community, of course, is, is the fact that we meet, but, but at present in this way online, unfortunately. And that's, that actually also brings to a problem that we are a networking community. And through the networking, we find collaborations and also new collaborations. So, uh, we, we are still expanding and linking with groups with, with different backgrounds and disciplines. But uh, now in the middle of, of this uh, uh, pandemic, which for us as an organization had some positive elements in the sense that we were able to do research uh, during this pandemic episode, and advice on, on mitigating the pandemic and mitigating the spread of the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. But at the same time, of course, we are also affected by, by this pandemic because we can't have live meetings. And actually, I think, uh, and Ludo already mentioned that, that has in particular negative side effects for our PhD students and also the teaching programs and the working groups, uh, the working group activities that we planned uh, with the, the PhD students and, and all our researchers. So it has brought us positive things in the sense of new collaborations and, and visibility, but certainly uh, we are also being affected. At the same time, and, and this is a uh, a list of initiatives that uh, started up over the last years, also as a response to the pandemic. Uh, the, the European uh, Clinical Network, for instance, uh, the, the, the ARES initiative from Waag University, the Pandemic Disaster Preparedness Center from Rotterdam University. Uh, so, initiatives by individual partners of NCOH, but which are also sort of brought in and lead to new linkages and new collaborations within NCOH. And, and so a major activity over the last month has been uh, our involvement in a large, in two large growth fund uh, uh, submissions. And in particular, the first one on the Delta Plan pandemic preparedness 
has been a really uh, orchestrated activity and planned activity uh, from from our NCOH uh, executive board that that has been actively involved in uh, uh, well articulating our involvement and and the submission uh, process. So really uh, a lively community uh, in in different ways. Um, hopefully with those activities and and in particular the new research initi initiatives we are now undertaking in this field of pandemic preparedness we we can uh, continue to con uh, contribute to global health uh, one health solutions and challenges so um, that's what i want to uh, uh, conclude with with this wish that that we remain a relevant organization for the coming five years. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dick. You've given us some examples, broadly speaking, about the contributions of NCOH during the pandemic. Is there, can you say, name some specific examples for us as well? Our initiatives, you mean? Um, well, I, I, I think in particular, uh, the, the activities for new research uh, proposals uh, in relation to pandemic preparedness uh, have been very important uh, but not only the, the the new proposals and the submissions but also during the pandemic uh, we have seen that that the fact that we have a network and people have learned to work together in that network already for five years it was, for instance, easy to start up uh, studies on, uh, well, from the moment that uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, also infected minks uh, in, in our farming uh, community. Uh, and, and so we see that different partners actually collaborated there. And I think the collaboration would not have been that efficient uh, without the prior collaboration within the NCOH framework. So, so that was one particular example, but there are many more. That, that, and, and also, of course, uh, yeah, a lot of our members are also visible uh, on, on television at present, but also have collaborations in, in different other studies, uh, serological studies in humans, uh, uh, occupationally exposed, etc. Uh, so many, many different projects that that actually emerged partially because we already collaborated within NCOH. Yeah, that sounds really good. I'm glad you sound very optimistic about NCOH. Can you give us some more future items to look forward to? Well, op optimistic. I th I think I I'm realistic. Um, uh, I think well, there is reason for optimism, mm -hmm. but 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 I think there are also some challenges. Uh, challenges, and I think already uh, Ludo mentioned uh, balancing the science with our societal mission. Um, but of course, we should always realize that well, uh, all those different research groups have their own research agendas. So in in one way, we compete. Uh, but on the other hand, we also collaborate. And that will always remain a, a difficult process to manage. Uh, and, and we see it in the executive board, how difficult that is sometimes to manage. But so far, I think the, 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 the advantages of collaboration have been much bigger mm. than, than, than going for one's own, uh, own good, basically. Uh, but that's something we always have to stress and define uh, uh, from, from moment to moment. Yes, absolutely. And collaboration requires networking and mingling and meeting, something we'll definitely do. A absolutely. And, and that is what we are lacking now. So hopefully uh, we have a very good spring meeting uh, in Wageningen next absolutely. year. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Edric. Now we move on to our next speaker. We have Auke de Jong. Uh, it's from Young NCOH. He's the chair of Young NCOH, and as we all know, the Young NCOH has have the future. Uh, Auke is a PhD candidate at Westerdijk Fungal Biodiversity Institute, and he will tell us more about the importance of Young NCOH and the future plans of NCOH. Young NCOH. Auke, floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you, Maarten. So yeah, I'm here to introduce to you the Young NCOH and hopefully also promote it, of course. Uh, so yeah, the young NCH, I guess, I think it's the future of One Health. 
and who are we? So the Young NCOH is an early career network for PhD students and postdocs. And uh, we started in 2019, so we're actually quite young, but we already have over 100 members. But hopefully today I can, can convince more people to join us. Um, this year a new board has started, and I'm representing this board today, but of course it's a team effort. So I'm doing this together with Aram, Lingyi, Luca, Remy, and Ayat. And what is our ambition? So we really want to connect young researchers. And I think the picture behind me really illustrates the situation most of us are in now. We're like quite isolated on our own islands, whether it's working from home or uh, being isolate, isolated within your institute. It's very hard to connect nowadays with others, especially due to COVID, of course, but also uh, in normal times, it can be quite hard to get out of your institute and really get to know others and see what they are doing. So that's why the young NCOH is here. So we aim to really be like the main island where all the students that are working at affiliated institutes can come together, network, learn new skills, start collaborations, and also just have a little bit of fun, of course. So how are we approaching this? So we have networking events. In the past, we had uh, an online event due to COVID, of course, but it was really nice together with OPECT. Uh, fortunately, we were able to finally meet in person a couple of months ago during a pub crawl in Utrecht. And it was a very casual way of just meeting your peers and uh, just see what others are doing. And well, in the future, we also aim to uh, organize institute visits because, of course, you have all these affiliated institutes, but usually we don't really know what is going on in each other's institute. So we hope to, re to be able to visit these institutes and really see and learn from each other what, what are we doing, what kind of research is going on, and how can we start maybe new collaborations and learn from each other, of course. We also organize masterclasses, uh, usually during the scientific cafes, but also, uh, for example, we did an online masterclass on writing, and uh, this was about how to improve your academic English. Uh, during one of the science cafes, we did a masterclass on presenting, uh, how to be a scientist and how to pitch it, uh, which is, of course, also important during the grant procedures. And uh, actually, today we were aiming to, to give a networking course because uh, yeah, uh, it's a long time ago for us all. It's <laughs> we've been very isolated. And uh, of course, it's been postponed, but uh, definitely, hopefully, during the next ASM, we will still be able to give this course and uh, we will learn how to network again. Uh, yeah. In the end, all our plans, of course, come together during these scientific events. Uh, as I was saying, in the past, uh, the young NCOH always played a role during the science cafes and all during the ASM. Uh, our members gave poster presentations, uh, there was a pitch competition, uh, and also just giving presentations highlighting our research. And in the future, like the ultimate goal of the young NCOH, of course, is to have our own young NCOH day, where we can really highlight uh, our own research and learn from each other and get to meet and expand our network. So I would say, what are you waiting for? Sign up to the Young NCOH. Uh, everything we do is tailored to your needs. So if you have any ideas or questions, please email us and uh, go to the website to sign up. And I would say stronger together with an R. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the young clearly outsmarts the old, <laughs> uh, at least in spelling that is. Yeah. Thank you, Auken. What do you expect from large institutes such as NCOH and the Royal Academy of Art and Science yeah. from us for you to help you move on. Yeah, I think I agree with what Ludo and Dick were saying that the, you have these uh, large organizations with all the different institutes and you should really use them to start collaborations, of course, and also uh, yeah, to see what others are doing, learn new skills, see new techniques. I think it's very important as a young researcher to see what is possible, what are the possibilities and what kind of research is being done in the Netherlands. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And what are some of the limitations that some of your fellow young NCOH PhD students mentioned to you? Hey, help us with that. Yeah, I think uh, especially now the limitation is that you're, that you're isolated on your own island. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get in contact with others. And, uh, but as I was saying also during normal times, it can be quite difficult to get out of your bubble and uh, really see what others are doing because everybody yeah, like researchers can be quite focused on their own work 
And of course, there's a collaboration going on, but everybody's doing one task. And it would be really nice just to see what everybody's doing and really learn from each other. Yes. Yeah. And who can join Young NCOH? Uh, yeah, all uh, PhDs and postdocs that are working at one of the affiliated institutes. I think they're underneath the slide and also the REVM is uh, mm -hmm. involved. Yes. And uh, yeah, so all, all of those students can join us practically. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Auke. Yeah, thank you. Right, our next speaker, our keynote speaker, and she is quite accomplished, so I definitely have to use my uh, cheat sheet. Professor Ineke Sluiter. She's professor of Greek language and literature at Leiden University, president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and her research focuses on, among other things, on anchoring innovation in classical antiquity. She connects the concerns and interests of the ancient world to those of the present. For example, freedom of speech, education and cultural identity. She received many awards, including the Spinoza Prize and the Academy Professor's Prize. And she's a member of the Royal Academy of Arts and Science. She's a member of the Academy of Europe and fellow of the British Academy. The list goes on, but she striped them off. She says it's too much. <laughs> For today, Professor Sluiter prepared a special message for all of us. A warm welcome, thank you, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And let me begin by congratulating the NCOH, which includes the KNAW, the KNAW, as an associated organization. So I realize this is a form of self-congratulation. But nevertheless, on your fifth anniversary, in these five years, the blossoming One Health field has only gained in importance and the theme keeps resonating in unexpected corners as when a couple of days ago, these Antwerp hippos, two of them actually, unusually well equipped for developing runny noses, were diagnosed with COVID. Apart from One Health related activities of KNAW members or researchers from KNAW research institutes, our academy is currently also working on an advisory report on the topic of planetary health under the chairmanship of Johan Mackenbach. The One Health approach has once again proven not only its value, but its inevitability in the COVID pandemic. Not only has the medical sector been crucial in the rapid analysis and attempts at containment of the disease, but the development of multiple effective vaccines within a year has rightly been celebrated as a scientific triumph. Trust in medical science has almost become a proxy for trust in science in general. Why is trust in science declining an interviewer asked me recently, and she wasn't the first one to ask so either. Truth is, it isn't, and it hasn't been. Trust within the Netherlands, as in many other countries, has risen during the pandemic, as shown by the research by the Ratenau Institute. They found that science is still the social institution that on average inspires most confidence and trust in the general public, with higher grades than the media or politics. But still, the question posed by the journalist sh should give us pause. Why did she somehow get the impression that trust in science is declining? A disproportional amount of attention to dissenters in the media may be part of the answer as is a misunderstanding of the target of large demonstrations by a very mixed group, mostly against policy, certainly not against science. If we look below the surface, we notice that while trust in general has gone up, some groups have indeed reported a decline. And interestingly, higher and lower trust are inspired by the same thing, the rapid development of the vaccines. 24% of respondents was impressed by the breakthrough, their trust went up, but 16% thought it was iffy and their trust went down. 
One factor that demonstrably affects trust negatively is when independence seems in doubt. Independence is equally important for the academic freedom of the researcher and for trust in science. And independence is especially believed to be impacted where outside funding plays a role, which may even prompt conspiracy theories. There is no need to spell it out. The collaboration between academia, the pharmaceutical industry and investors is problematic in the eyes of the general public, even though the majority still trusts science. Now, the medical sector obviously fully acknowledges the importance of independence. But the general public is not aware of the debates involved and the massive amount of work that is being done, for instance, in designing rules, protocols, codes of conduct, and in developing responsible and effective forms of cooperation between all stakeholders, such as Health RI, FAST, or the work of the ambassador Life Science and Health, Clemens Ros van Dorp. All these activities are evidence of a solid concern within the discipline to defend and safeguard its own integrity, the interests of the patients and our responsibility to serve society by making the results of scientific research effective where it matters. In that latter context, I am particularly proud of the recent KNAW report by a committee chaired by Jaap Verwey on the efficient development of medicines. However, something else is needed for the general public to understand the demands imposed by society itself, the dilemmas caused by those demands and the ways in which those dilemmas can be negotiated. It is one of the strategic priorities of our academy to feed and enrich public understanding of science. Well, here is a topic where that seems necessary. So let me begin by boldly saying that scientists, like all people, are in principle trustworthy. In a report entitled Good Science, a vision from within, good science in the double sense of, of high quality and morally good, the authors for once focus on what scientists themselves including two medical disciplines, see as the positive heart of their work. Taking an approach based on empirical ethics and ethnography, the researchers paint a picture uh, of science as a social and learning practice, characterized by commitment and drive to understand or improve an aspect of our world. An important finding is that scientists across disciplines are constantly engaging in an everyday ethics of figuring out the right thing to do. This happens through dialogue within the workplace and it frequently involves concrete dilemmas. However many codes of conduct we may design, dilemmas will always remain and they need to be sorted out by discussion among peers. We can serve public debate by being clearer about those dilemmas and our own process of dealing with them. Now, here's one example. Universities nowadays have added a third mission to their core business of teaching and research. The third mission is to ensure that the knowledge produced by our researchers benefits society. Our researchers are encouraged to engage directly in solving societal challenges or otherwise enrich societal debate. The general principle is a good one, and it goes for all disciplines. Knowledge utilization or valorization should be broadly defined. In fact, sending well-trained graduates out into society is one of the strongest ways in which we create added value. However, the general principle should not make us buy into the rhetoric of the latest pamphlet by the Universiteite van Nederland, the new name of the VSNW. Their pamphlet is all about increasing national earning power, ignoring all other types of value, 
through startups, scale-ups, and unicorns, the kind of business enterprises valued at over 1 billion on initial public offering or stock launch. But of course, societal relevance may very well clash with profitability. The hyperbolic rhetoric of the pamphlet suggests perverse expectations, clashes with core values of academia, and puts undue pressure on our researchers. A much more sensible approach is represented by another recent report by the Rathenau Institute between invention and challenge on the relationship between universities, startups, and society, in which they correctly identify the different raison d'etre of the stakeholders and the issues uh, that they entail. Universities are invaluable because of their independence. Companies seek to maximize profits. Fine. Society is susceptible to all kinds of political processes and pressures. Also fine. It may be important that universities support spin-outs and entrepreneurship, and this may even benefit their core business of teaching and unfettered researcher-driven research, but there are serious areas of tension. The division of profits, devising forms of support without creating conflicts of interest, the careful selection of startups supporting genuine societal interests, and the issue of double appointments of researchers at universities and in startups. Transparency is key, and the main thing to protect is academic independence. The third mission is real, it is important, and it will often involve public-private cooperation. Medicine development in particular is something that we need and want but that will never be funded or fundable by public money. So the question is, does the general public realize that we require of our scientists that they try to bring their res results to fruition and that there is no other way than the kind of collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry that is often frowned upon and disparaged so superficially and easily? There is nothing wrong with an ecosystem in which important goals are shared finding cures for patients, while other goals are not. Entrepreneurship, including making money, is a completely acceptable goal for pharma. Scientific breakthroughs and progress is what drives scientists. The differences are clear. Academic scientists invo involved in fundamental research are not entrepreneurs. They don't work at their own expense and risk. If they have tenure, they have good salaries, vacation days, health insurance. They make their discoveries in publicly funded labs with publicly funded materials and equipment. There is no reason why they should personally benefit in a disproportional way other than through scientific recognition. There may be such a thing as proportional benefits for inventors because we also want to retain good researchers in our universities as academic leaders and teachers of the next generation of researchers. But how to find the balance? This is exactly the kind of debate among peers on what is the right thing to do that I was referring to earlier. Transparency and communication with society at large are key. On the other hand, there is also no reason why pharmaceutical companies should be benefit disproportionately from publicly funded discoveries or clinical tests. To channel profits back into research is desirable and reasonable. How, to what extent, under what conditions of retained independence is again a matter of ethical negotiation. It is relatively clear at which point academic freedom and independence are at risk. A scenario that I was offered repeatedly in my conversations with colleagues on these issues is where a startup also needs investors. And the investors require that researchers have skin in the game. Skin in the game refers to the fact that a party standing to benefit will also suffer the negative consequences of failure. Nassim Taleb points out the many advantages of binding a party 
in this way. It will increase commitment for fear of losses of something uh, significant. In our case, from the perspective of the investors, the researcher must be financially involved in order to commit him or her, since at this point of the development process, the intellectual powers of the researcher are the main asset. Skin in the game is the kind of discourse that belongs, as Taleb says, to the world of finance, business, gambling, politics, not necessarily preferred analogues for academia. The toughness of the skin in the game talk may also seem appealing, but it belongs to a world in which the only criterion for success is money or power. Make no mistake. The corollary of skin in the game is loss of independence. And here we're back in the heart of the Rathenau analysis. This is the conversation that needs to be conducted with the investors, with our peers, and with the general public. There is a good reason why scientists are not entrepreneurs. Our independence is at the core of our academic work. I applaud the colleagues with whom I've spoken who are clear about where to draw the line. Going over to the business side entirely is a clear and defensible choice. But if we choose to remain on the academic side of things, we choose independence. This has consequences for the way in which we organize the still necessary collaboration with pharmaceutical industry and investors. It can be done and it is being done. Yes, but the public may object, how about conflicts of interest? Aren't they an automatic consequence? Well, there are certainly potential conflicts of interest. But what may not be generally understood is that the real question is how those are managed. For unless we want to eliminate expertise, we will always encounter potential conflicts of academic interest. If someone is an expert, he or she will be invited to relevant advisory positions, for instance. And at some point, but what is that point? the accumulation may become problematic. Here, as elsewhere, transparency is the only solution. Outside activities are usually not all taken up at the same time. Since full disclosure is necessary and in fact compulsory, many academics would have to do this on several websites simultaneously. It may be useful to start a central register for disclosing and reporting all outside activities. This reduces the risk of administrative lapses, at least within the Netherlands. It would be desirable if the report included a narrative detailing how the combined activities can be managed without actual conflicts of interest occurring. So, Society demands that our researchers engage in knowledge transfer, but this may also incur criticism. And a knowledge-based society wants expertise in the lead, but doesn't understand how this may entail potential role conflicts, and, or that the question is how to manage those conflicts, not to eradicate expertise. There's also a third area in which public understanding of medical research could be improved, and that's the position of the patient. The particularly intense public ethical scrutiny of medicine, more so than of other disciplines, is due precisely to the fact that patients are involved. Patients are vulnerable, they are dependent on their doctors, however, as the medical profession is completely aware, and excuse me, colleagues, if I'm bringing owls to Athens here, um, the medical profession may be aware, but society less so, there is a flip side, and this is that patients and patient organizations are active and often proud and assertive participants and stakeholders in research. Increasingly, Medicine developments is patient-centered and patient-driven from the beginning, as again emphasized by the KNAW report. Yet another dilemma to be negotiated is therefore, 
whether the boundary between care and research needs to be reinforced or made permeable. In that latter scenario, real-world data, increasingly important, would become available more structurally while patients can still opt out. Do patients have skin in the game? In one sense, obviously, yes. They experience the burden of sickness. But in another sense, not. Patients knowingly contribute to the greater good when they participate in research. And we're still talking about a very small percentage of the total patient population. But it usually will not benefit them personally, and they know this, while it also will not harm them, and they should know this, if they choose not to participate. So let me sum up. You have a lot on your plates, with the pandemic on your hands, your research, all your efforts to improve the ways in which your research may benefit society through carefully and ethically constructed ecosystems of all stakeholders while respecting their diverse roles and contributions. And we're talking academic research institutes, academic medical centers, clinicians, pharmaceutical companies, regulatory agencies, government, patients, organizations, and that doesn't even end it. However, what we do must not only be right, it must also be seen to be right. Sometimes by explaining, sometimes by modeling behavior and simply showing the public what we do, how to be a good scientist. Sometimes by an appeal to emotions. The Academy, the KNAW, has a duty to help in this enterprise. For as academics, we stand to win or lose the trust of society. And that is the real and the only way in which we have skin in the game. Thank you. Wow, that was really good. <laughs> I, th I think you've given us... Don't sound so surprised. No, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I mean, I'm... I'm well. Yes, I mean, it was... Y y you pulled in so much, and it is all really relevant, and I think you've given us a lot of food for thought, Thank you. a lot of handles to hold on to in discussions amongst ourselves and with others, uh, and, and a reading list, and perhaps Young and NCH will start a book club after this, but it was really good, and as a thank you, as a token of appreciation, uh, a book with the pandemic, wow, thank you. Um, with some visual um, aspects of the pandemic to flip through later, thank you. Uh, a bottle of wine to go down with it. It's, according to research, not very good for the heart, but it's very good for your microbiome. So <laughs> <laughs> again, it's it. all about balance. Uh, but thank you very much for agreeing to do this. And thank you very much for yeah, your point of view. Thank you. Thank you. With that, this n age webinar comes to an end, uh, wishes it ends now to wishing you a very festive season and we hope to see you in a very lively, celebrative setting at Wageningen, April, May, um, later, springtime next year. Thank you.